Chapter Four of Following the Color Line An Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy by Ray Stannard Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four In the Black Belt The Negro Farmer. The cotton picking season was drawing to its close when I left for the Black Belt of Georgia so many friends in atlanta had said the city negro isn't the real negro you must go out on the cotton plantations in the country there you'll see the genuine black african in all his primitive glory it is quite true that the typical negro is a farmer the great mass of the race in the south dwells in the country according to the last census out of eight million negroes in the southern states six million five hundred and fifty eight thousand one hundred and seventy three or eighty three per cent lived on the farms or in rural villages the crowded city life which i have already described represents not the common condition of the masses of the negro race but the newer development which accompanies the growth of industrial and urban life in the city the races are forced more violently together socially and economically than in the country producing acute crises but it is in the old agricultural regions where the negro is in such masses where ideas change slowly and old institutions persist that the problem really presents the greatest difficulties there is no better time of year to see the south than november for then it wears the smile of abundance. The country I went through, rolling red hills, or black bottoms, pine-clad in places, with pleasant farm openings dotted with cabins, often dilapidated but picturesque, and the busy little towns, wore somehow an air of brisk comfort. The fields were lively with negro cotton-pickers, I saw bursting loads of the new lint drawn by mules or oxen trailing along the country roads. All the gins were puffing busily. At each station, platform cotton bales by scores or hundreds stood ready for shipment, and the towns were cheerful with farmers, white and black, who now had money to spend. The heat of the summer had gone. The air bore the tang of a brisk autumn coolness. It was a good time of the year, and everybody seemed to feel it. Many Negroes got on or off at every station with laughter and snouted goodbyes. And so, just at evening, after a really interesting journey, I reached Hawkinsville, a thriving town of some 3,000 people just south of the center of Georgia. Pulaski County, of which Hawkinsville is the seat, with an ambitious new courthouse, is a typical county of the Black Belt. A census map which is here produced well shows the region of largest proportionate Negro population, extending from South Carolina through central Georgia and Alabama to Mississippi. More than half the inhabitants of all this broad belt including also the Atlantic coastal counties and the lower Mississippi Valley, as shaded on the map, are Negroes, chiefly farm Negroes. There the race question, though perhaps not so immediately difficult as the cities like Atlanta, is with both white and colored people the imminent problem of daily existence. Several times while in the Black Belt, I was amused at the ardent response of people to whom I mentioned the fact that I had already seen something of conditions in Kentucky, Maryland, and Virginia. Why, they haven't any Negro problem. They're North. In Maryland, Kentucky, and Texas, the problem is a sharp irritant, as it is, for that matter, in Ohio, in Indianapolis, and on the west side of New York City but it is not the life and death question that it is in the black belt or in the yazoo delta all the country of central georgia has been long settled 
Pulaski County was laid out in 1808, and yet the population today may be considered sparse. The entire county has only 8,000 white people, a large proportion of whom live in the towns of Hawkinsville and Cochrane, and 12,000 Negroes, leaving not inconsiderable areas of forest and uncultivated land which will some day become immensely valuable. A SOUTHERN COUNTRY GENTLEMAN At Hawkinsville I met J. Pope Brown, the leading citizen of the county. In many ways he is an example of the best type of the new Southerner. In every way open to him, and with energy, he is devoting himself to the improvement of his community. For five years he was president of the State Agricultural Society. He has been a member of the legislature and chairman of the Georgia Railroad Commission, and he represents all that is best in the new progressive movement in the South. One of the unpleasant features of the villages in the South are the poor hotels. In accounting for this condition, I heard a story illustrating the attitude of the Old South toward public accommodations. A number of years ago, before the death of Robert Toombs, who, as a member of Jefferson Davis's cabinet, was called the backbone of the Confederacy, the spirit of progress reached the town where Toombs lived. The thing most needed was a new hotel. The businessmen got together and subscribed money with enthusiasm, counting upon Toombs, who was their richest man, for the largest subscription but when they finally went to him he said what do we want of a hotel when a gentleman comes to town i will entertain him myself those who are not gentlemen we don't want that was the old spirit of aristocratic individualism the town did not get its hotel one of the public enterprises of mr brown at hawkinsville is a good hotel and what is rarer still, north and south, he has made his hotel building really worthy architecturally. Mr. Brown took me out to his plantation, a drive of some eight miles. In common with most of the larger plantation owners, as I found not only in Georgia, but in other southern states which I afterward visited, Mr. Brown makes his home in the city. After a while I came to feel a reasonable confidence in assuming that almost any prominent merchant, banker, lawyer, or politician whom I met in the towns owned a plantation in the country. From a great many stories of the fortunes of families that I heard, I concluded that the movement of white owners from the land to nearby towns was increasing every year high prices for cotton and consequent prosperity seem to have accelerated rather than retarded the movement white planters can now afford to live in town where they can have the comforts and conveniences where the servant question is not impossibly difficult and where there are good schools for the children another potent reason for the movement is the growing fear of the whites and especially the women and children, at living alone on great farms where white neighbors are distant. Statistics show that less crime is committed in the Black Belt than in other parts of the South. I found that the fear was not absent even among these people. I have a letter from a white man, P. S. George, of Greenwood, Mississippi, which expresses the country white point of view with singular earnestness. I live in a country of large plantations. If there are 40,000 people in that country, at least 30,000 are Negroes, and we never have any friction between the races. I have been here as a man for 20 years, and I never heard of but one case of attempted assault by a Negro on a white woman that negro was taken out and hanged i said that we never had any trouble with negroes but it's because we never take our eyes off the gun 
you may wager that i never leave my wife and daughter at home without a man in the house after ten o'clock at night because i am afraid as a result of these various influences a traveler in the black belt sees many plantation houses even those built in recent years standing vacant and forlorn or else occupied by white overseers who are in many parts of the south almost as difficult to keep as the negro tenants thousands of small white farmers both owners and renters of course remain but when the leading planters leave the country these men too grow discontented and get away at the first opportunity going to town they find ready employment for the whole family in the cotton mill or in other industries where they make more money and live with a degree of comfort that they never before imagined possible story of the mill people many cotton mills indeed employ agents whose business it is to go out through the country urging the white farmers to come to town and painting glowing pictures of the possibilities of life there i have visited a number of mill neighborhoods and talked with the operatives i found the older men sometimes homesick for free life of the farm one lanky old fellow said rather pathetically when it comes to cotton picking time and i know that they are grinding cane and hunting possums i just naturally get lonesome for the country but nothing would persuade the women and children to go back to the old hard life hawkinsville has a small cotton mill and just such a community of white workers around it owing to the scarcity of labor wages in the mills have been going up rapidly all over the south during the last two or three years furnishing a still more potent attraction for country people all these various tendencies are uniting to produce some very remarkable conditions in the south a natural segregation of the races is apparently taking place i saw it everywhere i went in the black belt the white people were gravitating toward the towns or into white neighborhoods and leaving the land even though still owned by white men more and more to the exclusive occupation of negroes many black counties are growing blacker while not a few white counties are growing whiter take for example pulaski county through which i drove that november morning with mr brown in eighteen seventy the colored and white population were almost exactly equal about six thousand for each in eighteen eighty the negroes had increased to eight thousand two hundred and twenty five while the whites showed a loss by eighteen ninety the towns had begun to improve and the white population grew by about seven hundred but the negroes increased nearly two thousand and finally here are the figures for nineteen hundred negroes eleven thousand twenty nine whites seven thousand four hundred and sixty i have not wished to darken our observations with too many statistics but this tendency is so remarkable that i wish to set down for comparison the figures of a white county in northern georgia polk county which is growing whiter every year eighteen eighty four thousand one hundred and forty seven negroes seven thousand eight hundred and five whites eighteen ninety four thousand six hundred and fifty four negroes ten thousand two hundred and eighty nine whites nineteen hundred four thousand nine hundred and sixteen negroes twelve thousand nine hundred and forty whites driving out negroes one of the most active causes of this movement is downright fear or race repulsion expressing itself in fear white people dislike and fear to live in dense colored neighborhoods 
while Negroes are often terrorized in white neighborhoods, and not in the South only, but in parts of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, as I shall show when I come to treat of northern race conditions. I have accumulated many instances showing how Negroes are expelled from white neighborhoods. There is a significant report from Little Rock, Arkansas. Special to the Georgian Little Rock, Arkansas, January 1st Practically every Negro in evening shade, sharp county, in this state, has left town as the result of threats which have been made against the Negroes. For several years a small colony of Negroes has lived just on the outskirts of the town. A short time ago, notices were posted warning the Negroes to leave the town at once. About the same time, Joe Brooks, a Negro who lived with his family two miles north of town, was called to his door and fired upon by unknown persons. A load of shot struck the house close by his side, and some of the shot entered his arm. Brooks and his family have left the country, and practically every member of the Negro colony is gone. They have abandoned their property or disposed of it for whatever they could get. From the New Orleans Times Democrat of March 20, 1907, I cut the following dispatch showing one method pursued by the whites of Oklahoma. Blacks ordered out. Lawton, Oklahoma, March 20th. Negroes, beware the cappers. We, the sixty sons of Warica, demand the Negroes to leave here at once. We mean go. Leave in twenty-four hours, or after that your life is uncertain. These were the words on placards which the eighty Negroes of the town of Warica, forty miles south of Lawton, saw posted conspicuously in a number of public places this morning. Dispatches from here tonight stated that the whites are in earnest, and that the Negroes will be killed if they do not leave town. Not a few students of Southern conditions like John Temple Graves among the whites and Bishop Turner among the colored people have argued that actual physical separation of the races, either by deportation of the Negroes to Africa or elsewhere, or by giving them certain reservation-like parts of the South to live in, is the only solution. But here is, in actuality, a natural segregation going forward in certain parts of the South, though in a very different way from that recommended by Mr. Graves and Bishop Turner. For even in the blackest counties, the white people own most of the land, occupy the towns, and dominate everywhere politically, socially, and industrially. Mr. Brown's plantation contains about 5,000 acres, of which some 3,500 acres are in cultivation, a beautiful rolling country, well watered, with here and there clumps of pines, and dotted with the small homes of the tenantry. As we drove along the country road, we met or passed many Negroes who bowed with the greatest deference. Some were walking, but many drove horses or mules, and rode not infrequently in top buggies, looking most prosperous, as indeed Mr. Brown informed me that they were. He knew them well, and sometimes stopped to ask them how they were getting along. The outward relationships between the races in the country seem to me to be smoother than it is in the city. Cotton, as in all this country, is almost the exclusive crop. In spite of the constant preaching of agricultural reformers, like Mr. Brown himself, hardly enough corn is raised to supply the people with food, and I was surprised here and elsewhere at seeing so few cattle and hogs. Sheep are non-existent. In Hawkinsville, though the country round about raises excellent grass, I saw in front of a supply store 
bales of hay which had been shipped in four hundred miles from tennessee enough sugar-cane is raised mostly in small patches to supply syrup for domestic uses at the time of my visit the negroes were in the cane fields with their long knives getting in the crop we saw several little one-horse grinding mills pressing the juice from the cane while near at hand sheltered by a shanty-like roof was the great simmering syrup kettle with an expert negro at work stirring and skimming and always there were negroes round about all the boys and girls with jolly smeared faces and the older ones peeling and sucking the fresh cane it was a great time of year how does the landlord and a lord he is in every true sense manage his great estate the same system is in use with slight variations elsewhere in the cotton country and a description of mr brown's methods with references here and there to what i have seen or heard elsewhere will give an excellent idea of the common procedure a country of great plantations the black belt is a country of great plantations some owners having as high as thirty thousand acres interspersed with smaller farms owned by the poorer white families or negroes in one way the conditions are similar to those prevailing in ireland great landlords and a poor tenantry or peasantry the tenants here being very largely black it requires about a hundred families or six hundred people to operate mr brown's plantation of these ninety per cent are colored and ten per cent white i was much interested in what mr brown said about his negro tenants which varies somewhat from the impression i had in the city of the younger negro generation i would much rather have young negroes for tenants he said because they work better and seem more disposed to take care of their farms the old negroes ordinarily will shirk a habit of slavery besides the residence of the overseer and the homes of the tenants there is on the plantation a supply store owned by mr brown a blacksmith shop and a negro church which is also used as a schoolhouse this is i found all through the black belt a common equipment three different methods are pursued by the landlord in getting his land cultivated first the better class of tenants rent the land for cash a standing rent of some three dollars an acre though in many places in mississippi it ranges as high as six dollars and eight dollars an acre second a share crop rental in which the landlord and the tenant divide the cotton and corn produced third the ordinary wage system that is the landlord hires workers at so much a month and puts in his own crop all three of these methods are usually employed on the larger plantations mr brown rents twenty five hundred acres for cash four hundred on shares and farms six hundred himself with wage workers all the methods of land measurement are very different here from what they are in the north the plantation is irregularly divided up into what are called one mule or one plow farms just that amount of land which a family can cultivate with one mule usually about thirty acres some ambitious tenants will take a two mule or even a four mule farm the negro tenant most of the tenants especially the negroes are very poor and wholly dependent upon the landlord many negro families possess practically nothing of their own save their ragged clothing and a few dollars worth of household furniture cooking utensils and a gun the landlord must therefore supply them not only with enough to live on while they are making their crop but with the entire farming outfit 
let us say that a negro comes in november to rent a one-mule farm from the landlord for the coming year what have you got asks the landlord nothing boss he is quite likely to say the boss furnishes him with a cabin to live in which goes with the land rented a mule a plow possibly a one-horse wagon and a few tools he is often given a few dollars in cash near christmas time which ordinarily he immediately spends wastes he is then allowed to draw upon the plantation supply store a regular amount of corn to feed his mule and meat bread and tobacco and some clothing for his family the cost of the entire outfit and supplies for a year is in the neighborhood of three hundred dollars upon which the tenant pays interest at from ten to thirty per cent from the time of signing the contract in november although most of the supplies are not taken out until the next summer besides this interest the planter also makes a large profit on all the groceries and other necessities furnished by his supply store having made his contract the negro goes to work with his whole family and keeps at it until the next fall when the cotton is all picked and ginned then he comes in for his settlement a great time of year the settlements were going forward while i was in the black belt the negro is credited with the amount of cotton he brings in and he is charged with all the supplies he has had and interest together with the rent of his thirty acres of land if the season has been good and he has been industrious he will often have a nice profit in cash but sometimes he not only does not come out even but closes his year of work actually in deeper debt to the landlord some negroes nowadays usually of the poorer sort work for wages they get from twelve dollars to fifteen dollars a month against five dollars to eight dollars a few years ago with a cabin to live in they are allowed a garden patch where they can if they are industrious and their families help raise enough vegetables to feed them comfortably or part of the bale of cotton which is their own but it is sadly to be commented upon that few negro tenants or whites either as far as i could see do anything with their gardens save perhaps to raise a few collards peanuts and peppers and possibly a few sweet potatoes this is due in part to indolence and lack of ambition and in part to the steady work required by the planter the wife and children of an industrious wage-working negro nearly always help in the fields earning an additional income from chopping cotton in spring and picking the lint in the fall this is the system as it is in theory but the interest for us lies not in the plan but in the actual practice how does it all work out for good or for evil for landlord and for tenant tenantry in the south is a very different thing from what it is in the north in the north a man who rents a farm is nearly as free to do as he pleases as if he were the owner but in the south the present tenant system is much nearer the condition that prevailed in slavery times than it is to the present northern tenant system this grows naturally out of slavery the white man had learned to operate big plantations with ignorant help and the negro on his part had no training for any other system the white man was the natural master and the negro the natural dependent and a mere emancipation proclamation did not at once change the spirit of the relationship today a white overseer resides on every large plantation and he or the owner himself looks after and disciplines the tenants the tenant is in debt to him 
in some cases reaching a veritable condition of debt slavery or peonage, and he must see that the crop is made. Hence he watches the work of every Negro, and indeed that of the white tenants as well, sees that the land is properly fertilized, and that the dikes, to prevent washing, are kept up, that the cotton is properly chopped or thinned, and regularly cultivated. Some of the greater landowners employ assistant overseers or riders who are constantly traveling from farm to farm. On one plantation I saw four such riders start out one day, each with a rifle on his saddle. And on a South Carolina plantation I had a glimpse of one method of discipline. A planter was telling me of his difficulties, how a spirit of unruliness sometimes swept abroad through a plantation, inspired by some bigoty nigger. "'Do you know what I do with such cases?' he said. "'Come with me. I'll show you.' He took me back through his house to the broad porch, and reaching up to a shelf over the door, he took down a hickory wagon spoke as long as my arm. "'When there's trouble,' he said, "'I just go down with that and lay one or two of them out. "'That ends the trouble. "'We've got to do it. "'They're like children, and once in a while they simply have to be punished. "'It's far better for them to take it this way, from a white man who is their friend, "'than to be arrested and taken to court and sent to the chain gang.' End of Part 1 of Chapter 4《Part 2 of Chapter 4 of Following the Color Line — An Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy — by Ray Stannard Baker — This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. TROUBLES OF THE LANDLORD Planters told me of all sorts of difficulties they had to meet with their tenants. One of them, after he had spent a whole evening telling me of the troubles which confronted any man who tried to work Negroes, summed it all up with the remark, "'You've just got to make up your mind that you are dealing with children and handle them as firmly and kindly as you know how.' He told me how hard it was to get a Negro tenant, even in the busy season, to work a full week, and it was often only by withholding the weekly food allowance that it could be done. Saturday afternoon, or evening, as they say in the South, the Negro goes to town or visits his friends. Often he spends all day Sunday driving about the country, and his mule comes back so worn out that it cannot be used on Monday. There are often furious religious revivals which break into the work, to say nothing of frolics and fish suppers at which the Negroes often remain all night long. Many of them are careless with their tools, wasteful of supplies, irresponsible in their promises. One planter told me how he had built neat fences around the homes of his Negroes, and fixed up their houses to encourage them in thrift and give them more comfort, only to have the fences and even parts of the houses used for firewood. Toward fall, if the season had been bad and the crop of cotton is short, so short that a negro knows that he will not be able to pay out and have anything left for himself, he will sometimes desert the plantation entirely leaving the cotton unpicked and a large debt to the landlord. If he attempts that, however, he must get entirely away, else the planter will chase him down and bring him back to his work. Illiterate, without discipline or training, with little ambition and much indolence, a large proportion of Negro tenants are looked after and driven like children or slaves. I say a large proportion, 
but there are thousands of industrious negro landowners and tenants who are rapidly getting ahead as i shall show in my next chapter in this connection it is a noteworthy fact that a considerable number of the white tenants require almost as much attention as the negroes though they are of course treated in an entirely different way one planter in alabama said to me give me negroes every time i wouldn't have a low-down white tenant on my place you can get work out of any negro if you know how to handle him but there are some white men who won't work and can't be driven because they are white race troubles in the country in short when slavery was abolished it gave place to a sort of feudal tenantry system which continues widely today and it has worked with comparative satisfaction at least to the landlords until within the last few years when the next step in the usual evolution of human society industrial and urban development began seriously to disturb the feudal equilibrium of the cotton country it was a curious idea human enough that men should attempt to legislate slaves immediately into freedom but nature takes her own methods of freeing slaves they are slower than men's ways but more certain the change now going on in the south from the feudal agricultural life to sharpened modern conditions has brought difficulties for the planter compared with which all others pale into insignificance i mean the scarcity of labor industry is competing with agriculture for the limited supply of negro workers negroes responding to exactly the same natural laws that control the white farmers have been moving cityward entering other occupations migrating west or north where more money is to be made agricultural wages have therefore gone up and rents relatively have gone down and had the south not been blessed for several years with wonderful returns from its monopoly crop there might have been a more serious crisis cry of the south more labor if the south today could articulate its chief need we should hear a single great shout more labor out of this struggle for tenants servants and workers has grown the chief complications of the negro problem and i am not forgetting race prejudice or the crimes against women indeed it has seemed to me that the chief difficulty in understanding the negro problem lies in showing how much of the complication in the south is due to economic readjustments and how much to instinctive race repulsion or race prejudice a tenant stealer in one town i visited not hawkinsville i was standing talking with some gentlemen in the street when i saw a man drive by in a buggy do you see that man they asked me i nodded well he is the greatest tenant stealer in this country i heard a good deal about these tenant stealers a whole neighborhood will execrate one planter who to keep his land cultivated will lure away his neighbor's negroes sometimes he will offer more wages sometimes he will give the tenants better houses to live in and sometimes he succeeds by that sheer force of a masterful personality which easily controls an ignorant tenantry i found moreover that there was not only a struggle between individual planters for negro tenants but between states and sections many of the old farms in south carolina and alabama have been used so long that they require a steady and heavy annual treatment of fertilizer with the result that cotton growing costs more than it does in the rich alluvial lands of mississippi or the newer regions of arkansas and texas the result is that the planters of the west 
being able to pay more wages and give the tenants better terms lure away the negroes of the east georgia and other states have met this competitive disadvantage in the usual way in which such disadvantages when first felt but not fully understood are met by counteracting legislation georgia has made the most stringent laws to keep her negroes on the land the georgia code section 601 says any person who shall solicit or procure emigrants or shall attempt to do so without first procuring a license as required by law shall be guilty of a misdemeanor ex-congressman william h fleming one of the ablest statesmen of georgia said land and other forms of capital cannot spare the negro and will not give him up until a substitute is found his labor is worth millions upon millions in georgia we now make it a crime for anyone to solicit emigrants without taking out a license and then we make the license as nearly prohibitive as possible one of the most dangerous occupations for any one to follow in this state would be that of an emigrant agent as some have found by experience in this connection i have an account published in april nineteen o seven in an augusta newspaper of just such a case the heaviest fine given in the city court of richmond county within the last two years was imposed upon e f arnett yesterday morning he was sentenced to pay a fine of one thousand dollars or serve six months in the county jail arnett was convicted of violating the state emigration laws regarding the carrying of labor out of the state he was alleged to have employed thirteen negroes to work on the georgia and atlantic railroad which operates in this state and alabama the jury on the case returned a verdict of guilty when court convened yesterday although it had been reported that a mistrial was probable peg leg williams a famous railroad emigration agent called peg leg williams who promoted negro emigration from georgia to mississippi and texas a few years ago was repeatedly prosecuted and finally driven out of business in a letter which he wrote some time ago to the atlanta constitution he said i know of several counties not a hundred miles from atlanta where it's more than a man's life is worth to go in to get negroes to move to some other state there are farmers that would not hesitate to shoot their brother were he to come from mississippi to get his niggers as he calls them even though he had no contract with them i know personally numbers of negro men who have moved west and after accumulating a little return to get a brother sister or an old father or mother and they were compelled to return without them their lives being imperiled they had to leave and leave quick in view of such a feeling it may be imagined how futile is the talk of the deportation of the negro race what the southern planter wants today is not fewer negroes but more negroes negroes who will keep their place laws to make the negro work many other laws have been passed in the southern states which are designed to keep the negro on the land and having him there to make him work the contract law the abuses of which lead to peonage and debt slavery is an excellent example which i shall discuss more fully in the next chapter the criminal laws the chain gang system and the hiring of negro convicts to private individuals are all in one way or another devices to keep the negro at work on farms in brickyards and in mines the vagrancy laws not unlike those of the north and excellent in their purpose are here sometimes executed with great severity 
in alabama the last legislature passed a law under which a negro arrested for vagrancy must prove that he is not a vagrant in short the old rule of law that a man is innocent until proven guilty is here reversed for the negro so that the burden of proving that he is not guilty of vagrancy rests upon him not upon the state the last alabama legislature also passed a stringent game law one argument in its favor being that by preventing the negro from pot hunting it would force him to work more steadily in the cotton fields race hatred versus economic necessity one of the most significant things i saw in the south and i saw it everywhere was the way in which the white people were torn between their feeling of race prejudice and their downright economic needs hating and fearing the negro as a race though often loving individual negroes they yet want him to work for them they can't get along without him in one impulse a community will rise to mob negroes or to drive them out of the country because of negro crime or negro vagrancy or because the negro is becoming educated acquiring property and getting out of his place and in the next impulse laws are passed or other remarkable measures taken to keep him at work because the south can't get along without him from the atlanta georgian i cut recently a letter which well illustrates the way in which racial hatred clashes with economic necessity troubles of country folk but aren't there two sides to every question here we are out here in the country right in the midst of hundreds of negroes and do you know sir that all this talk about lynching and ku kluxing is frightening the farmhands to such an extent we begin to fear that soon the farmers will sustain a great loss of labor by their running away already it is beginning to have its effect after night the negroes are afraid to leave their farm to go anywhere on errands of business why sir two miles from this town the negroes are afraid to come here to trade at night the country merchants are feeling the force of it very sorely and if this foolishness isn't stopped their losses in fall trade will be very heavy even some of the ladies of our community are complaining of this rashness that it is demoralizing the labor in the home department so in conclusion in behalf of my community and other country communities i feel it my duty to raise a warning voice against all such new foolish ku kluxism t j low mableton georgia while i was in georgia a case came up which threw a flood of light upon the inner complexities of this problem in the county of habersham in north georgia the population is largely of the type known as poor white the famous mountain folk who were never slave owners and many of whom fought in the union army during the civil war habersham is one of the white counties which is growing whiter it has about two thousand negroes and twelve thousand whites many of the latter having come in from the north to grow peaches and raise sheep one of the negroes in habersham county was frank grant described by a white neighbor as a negro of good character a property owner setting an example of thrift and honesty that ought to have made his example a benefit to any community grant had saved money from his labor and bought a home he was such a good worker that people were willing sometimes to pay him twice the wages of the average laborer white or black on the night of december sixteenth nineteen o six the negro's house was fired into by a party of white men who then went to the house of his tenant henry sism also a negro and shot promiscuously around Sism's house, and wanted him to leave the country in one week, 
threatening him with severe penalties if he did not go. As a result, Grant had to sell out his little home, one after such hard work, and he and his tenant Schism, with their families, both fled the county. "'In Grant,' said his white neighbor, "'the county lost a capable laborer, in its present situation a most valuable asset, and a good citizen.'" Here, then, we have race hatred versus economic necessity. The important citizens and employees of Habersham County came to Atlanta and presented a petition to Governor Terrell, January 18, 1907, as follows. To His Excellency J. M. Terrell, Governor of Georgia, Atlanta. Whereas, on the night of December 16, 1906, parties unknown came to the quiet home of one Frank Grant, colored, a citizen of this county, and shot into his residence, and then went to the home of Henry Schism, colored, a tenant of said Frank Grant, and shot promiscuously around his, the said Schism's, house, and demanded of him to leave the county under severe penalty. This has caused the tenant Henry Schism to leave, and Frank Grant to sell his little house at a sacrifice and leave. It comes to us that Frank Grant is a quiet, innocent, hard-working citizen. Therefore we, the undersigned officers and citizens of Habersham County, Georgia, pray you to offer a liberal reward for the arrest and conviction of these unknown parties. Say one hundred dollars for the first, and fifty dollars for each succeeding one. Signed, C. W. Grant, County School Commissioner, J. A. Irwin Clerk, S. C., M. Franklin, Ordinary, J. D. Hill, T. C. H. C. But, of course, nothing could be done that would keep the Negroes on the land under such conditions. Why Negroes Are Driven Out What does it all mean? Listen to the explanation given by a prominent white man of Habersham County, not to me, but to the Atlanta Georgian, where it was published. It is not a problem of Negro labor, because there is little of that kind here. The white labor will not work for the fruit growers at prices they can afford, even when it is a good fruit year. Often they decline to work at any price. They have many admirable qualities. Among them is a spirit of pride and independence, which, rightly directed, would uplift and make them prosperous, but which, misguided and blind, as it sometimes is, keeps them in poverty and puts the region in which they live at great disadvantage. Landowners and employers, native and new, are indignant but helpless. They are in the power of the shiftless element of the whites who say, I will work or not as I please, and when I please, and at my own price, and I will not have Negroes taking my work away from me. This is not a race question, pure and simple. It is an industrial question, a labor issue not confined to one part of the country. Here, it will be observed, the same complaint is made against the poor white as against the Negro, that he is shiftless and that he won't work even for high wages. Generally speaking, the race hatred in the South comes chiefly from the poorer classes of whites who either own land which they work themselves or are tenant farmers in competition with Negroes and from politicians who seek to win the votes of this class of white men. The larger landowners and employers of labor, while they do not love the Negro, want him to work and work steadily, and will do almost anything to keep him on the land, so long as he is a faithful, obedient, unambitious worker. When he becomes prosperous or educated or owns land, Many white people no longer have any use for him, 
and turn upon him with hostility but the best type of the southern white men is not only glad to see the negro become a prosperous and independent farmer but will do much to help him vivid illustration of race feeling i have had innumerable illustrations of the extremes of which race feeling reaches among a certain class of southerners in a letter to the atlanta constitution november fifth nineteen o six a writer who signs himself mark johnson says the only use we have for the negro is as a laborer it is only as such that we need him it is only as such that we can use him if the north wants to take him and educate him we will bid him godspeed and contribute to his education if schools are located on the other side of the line and here are extracts from a remarkable letter from a southern white working man signing himself forrest pope and published in the atlanta georgian october twenty second nineteen o six when the skilled negro appears and begins to elbow the white man in the struggle for existence don't you know the white man rebels and won't have it so if you don't it won't take you long to find it out just go out and ask a few of them those who will tell you the whole truth and see what you will find out about it what is the negro's place all the genuine southern people like the negro as a servant and so long as he remains the hewer of wood and carrier of water and remains strictly in what we choose to call his place everything is all right but when ambition prompted by real education causes the negro to grow restless and he bestir himself to get out of that servile condition then there is or at least there will be trouble sure enough trouble that all the great editors parsons and philosophers can no more check than they can now state the whole truth and nothing but the truth about this all-absorbing far-reaching miserable race question there are those among southern editors and other public men who have been shouting into the ears of the north for twenty-five years that education would solve the negro question there is not an honest fearless thinking man in the south but who knows that to be a barefaced lie take a young negro of little more than ordinary intelligence even get hold of him in time train him thoroughly as to books and finish him up with a good industrial education send him out into the south with ever so good intentions both on the part of his benefactor and himself send him away to take my work away from me and i will kill him the writer says in another part of this remarkable letter giving as it does a glimpse of the bare bones of the economic struggle for existence i am i believe a typical southern white working man of the skilled variety and i'll tell the whole world including doctors abbott and elliot that i don't want any educated property-owning negro around me the negro would be desirable to me for what i could get out of him in the way of labor that i don't want to have to perform myself and i have no other uses for him who will do the dirty work one illustration more and i am through i met at montgomery alabama a lawyer named gustav frederick mertens we were discussing the problem and mr mertens finally made a striking remark not at all expressing the view that i heard from some of the strongest citizens of montgomery but excellently voicing the position of many southerners it's a question he said who will do the dirty work in this country the white man won't the negro must there's got to be a mudsill somewhere if you educate the negroes they won't stay where they belong and you must consider them as a race because if you let a few rise it makes the others discontented 
Mr. Mertens presented me with a copy of his novel called The Storm Signal, in which he further develops the idea. Page 342. The Negro is the mudsill of the social and industrial South today. Upon his labor in the field, in the forest, and in the mine, the whole structure rests. Slip the mudsill out, and the system must be reorganized. Educate him, and he quits the field. Instruct him in the trades and sciences, and he enters into active competition with the white man in what are called the higher planes of life. That competition brings on friction, and that friction in the end means the Negro's undoing. Is not this mudsill stirring today, and is not that the deep reason for many of the troubles in the South, and in the North as well, where the Negro has appeared in large numbers? The friction of competition has arrived, and despite the demand for justice by many of the best class of the Southern whites, the struggle is certainly of growing intensity. And out of this economic struggle of whites and blacks grows an ethical struggle far more significant. It is the struggle of the white man with himself. How shall he, who is supreme in the South as in the North, treat the Negro? That is the real struggle. End of chapter 4« Chapter Five of Following the Color Line, An Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy by Ray Standard Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five Race Relationships in the South Generally speaking, the sharpest race prejudice in the South is exhibited by the poorer class of white people whether farmers, artisans, or unskilled workers, who come into active competition with the Negroes, or from politicians who are seeking the votes of this class of people. It is this element which has driven the Negroes out of more than one community in the South, and it commonly forms the lynching mobs. A similar antagonism of the working classes exists in the North, wherever the Negro has appeared in large numbers, as I shall show when I come to write of the treatment of the northern Negro. On the other hand, the larger landowners and employers of the South, and all professional and businessmen who hire servants, while they dislike and fear the Negro as a race, though often loving and protecting individual Negroes, want the black man to work for them. More than that, they must have him for he has a practical monopoly on labor in the South. White men of the employing class will do almost anything to keep the Negro on the land and his wife in the kitchen, so long as they are obedient and unambitious workers. Good and Bad Landlords But I had not been very long in the black belt before I began to see that the large planters, the big employers of labor, often pursued very different methods in dealing with the negro in the feudal middle ages there were good and bad barons so in the south today there are good and bad landlords for lack of a better designation and every gradation between them the good landlord generally speaking is the one who knows by inheritance how a feudal system should be operated in other words he is the old slave owner or his descendant who not only feels the ancient responsibility of slavery times but believes that the good treatment of tenants as a policy will produce better results than harshness and force the bad landlord represents the degeneration of the feudal system he is in farming to make all he can out of it this year and next without reference to human life I have already told something of J. Pope Brown's plantation near Hawkinsville. On the November day when we drove out through it, I was impressed with the fact that nearly all the houses used by the Negro tenants were new, 
and much superior to the old log cabins built either before or after the war some of which i saw still standing vacant and dilapidated in various parts of the plantation i asked the reason why he had built new houses well he answered i find i can keep a better class of tenants if the accommodations are good liquor and the resulting trouble mr brown has other methods for keeping the tenantry of his plantation satisfied every year he gives a barbecue and frolic for his negroes with music and speaking and plenty to eat a big watermelon patch is also a feature of the plantation and during all the year the tenants are looked after not only to see that the work is properly done but in more intimate and sympathetic ways on one trip through the plantation we stopped in front of a negro cabin inside lay a negro boy close to death from a bullet wound in the head he had been at a negro party a few nights before where there was liquor someone had overturned the lamp shooting began and the young fellow was taken out for dead such accidents or crimes are all too familiar in the plantation country although pulaski county georgia prohibits the sale or purchase of liquor most of the South indeed is prohibition in its sentiment, the Negroes are able from time to time to get jugs of liquor, and, as one Southerner puts it to me, enjoy the resulting trouble. The boy's father came out of the field and told us with real eloquence of sorrow of the patient's condition. Last night, he said, we done thought he was across in the river. Mr. Brown had already sent the doctor out from the city. He now made arrangements to transport the boy to a hospital in Macon, where he could be properly treated. USE OF COCAINE AMONG NEGROES As I have said before, the white landlord who really tries to treat his Negroes well often has a hard time of it. Many of those, not all, he deals with are densely ignorant irresponsible indolent and often rendered more careless from knowing that the white man must have labor many of them will not keep up the fences or take care of their tools or pick the cotton even after it is ready without steady attention a prominent mississippi planter gave me an illustration of one of the troubles he just then had to meet an eighteen-year-old negro left his plantation to work in a railroad camp there he learned to use cocaine and when he came back to the plantation he taught the habit to a dozen of the best negroes there to their complete ruin the planter had the entire crowd arrested searched for cocaine and kept in jail until the habit was broken then he prosecuted the white druggist who sold the cocaine some southern planters to prevent the negroes from leaving have built churches for them and in one instance i heard of a schoolhouse as well another point of the utmost importance for it strikes at the selfish interest of the landlord lies in the treatment of the negro who by industry or ability can get ahead a good landlord not only places no obstacles in the way of such tenants but takes a real pride in their successes. Mr. Brown said, If a tenant sees that other Negroes on the same plantation have been able to save money and get land of their own, it tends to make them more industrious. It pays the planter to treat his tenants well. Negro with a thousand dollars in the bank the result is that a number of mr brown's tenants have bought and owned good farms near the greater plantation the plantation indeed becomes a sort of central sun around which revolves like planets the lesser life of the negro landowner mr brown told me with no little pride of the successes of several negroes we met one farmer driving to town in a top buggy with a negro schoolteacher his name was robert paulhill 
a good type of the self-respecting, vigorous, industrious Negro. Afterward, we visited his farm. He had an excellent house with four rooms. In front there were vines and decorative chicken corn. A fence surrounded the place, and it was really in good repair. Inside the house everything was scrupulously neat, from the clean rag rugs to the huge post beds with their gay coverlets. The wife evidently had some Indian blood in her veins. She could read and write, but Paul Hill himself was a full black negro, intelligent but illiterate. The children, and there were a lot of them, are growing up practically without opportunity for education because the school held in the negro church is not only very poor, but it is in session only a short time every year. Near the house was a one-horse syrup mill then in operation, grinding cane brought in by neighboring farmers, white as well as black, the whites thus patronizing the enterprise of their energetic negro neighbor. "'I first noticed Paul Hill when he began work on the plantation,' said Mr. Brown, "'because he was the only negro on the place whom I could depend upon to stop hog cracks in the fences.' His history is the common history of the negro farmer who gets ahead. Starting as a wages hand, he worked hard and steadily, saving enough finally to buy a mule, the negro's first purchase. Then he rented land, and by hard work and close calculating made money steadily. With his first seventy-five dollars, he started out to see the world traveling by railroad to Florida, and finally back home again. The moving about instinct is strong in all Negroes, sometimes to their destruction. Then he bought a hundred acres of land on credit, and having good crops, paid for it in six or seven years. Now he has a comfortable home, he is out of debt, and has money in the bank. A painted house, a top buggy and a cabinet organ. These are the values of his property. His farm is worth two thousand dollars, two mules three hundred dollars, a horse a hundred and fifty dollars, other equipment five hundred and fifty dollars, money in the bank a thousand dollars, total four thousand dollars. Negro who owns a thousand acres of land. All of this shows what a Negro who is industrious and who comes up on a plantation where the landlord is not oppressive can do. And despite the fact that much is heard on the one hand of the lazy and worthless Negro and on the other of the landlord who holds his Negroes in practical slavery, it is significant that many Negroes are able to get ahead. In Pulaski County, there are Negroes who own as high as a thousand acres of land. Ben Gordon is one of them. His brother Charles has five hundred acres. John Nelson has four hundred acres, worth twenty dollars an acre. The Miller family has a thousand acres. January Lawson, another of Mr. Brown's former tenants, has five hundred acres. Jack Daniel, two hundred acres. Tom Whalen, 600 acres. A mulatto merchant in Hawkinsville, whose creditable store I visited, also owns his plantation in the county and rents it to Negro tenants on the same system employed by the white landowners. Indeed, a few Negroes in the South are coming to be not inconsiderable landlords and have many tenants. Hawkinsville also has a Negro blacksmith, negro barbers and negro builders and like the white man the negro also develops his own financial sharks one educated colored man in hawkinsville is a note shaver he stands for other negroes and signs their notes at a frightful commission statistics will give some idea of how the industrious negro in a black belt county like pulaski has been succeeding 1875, 4,490 acres of land owned. 
total assessed value of property forty three thousand two hundred and thirty dollars eighteen eighty five thousand nine hundred and eighty eight acres of land owned total assessed value of property sixty thousand seven hundred and sixty dollars eighteen eighty five six thousand nine hundred and one acres of land owned total assessed value of property fifty nine thousand and twenty two dollars in eighteen ninety twelve thousand two hundred and ninety four acres of land owned total assessed value of property one hundred and twenty two thousand nine hundred and twenty six dollars in eighteen ninety five fourteen thousand one hundred and forty five acres of land owned total assessed value of property one hundred and forty four thousand one hundred and fifty eight dollars nineteen hundred thirteen thousand two hundred and five acres of land owned total assessed value of property a hundred and thirty eight thousand eight hundred dollars it is surprising to an unfamiliar visitor to find out that the Negroes in the South have acquired so much land. In Georgia alone in 1906, colored people owned 1,400,000 acres and were assessed for over $28 million worth of property, practically all of which, of course, has been acquired in the 40 years since slavery. Negro farmers in some instances have made a genuine reputation for ability. John Roberts, a Richmond County Negro, won first prize over many white exhibitors in the fall of 1906 at the Georgia-Carolina Fair at Augusta for the best bale of cotton raised. Little Colored Boy's Famous Speech I was at Macon while the first state fair ever held by Negroes in Georgia was in progress. In spite of the fact that racial relationships, owing to the recent riot at Atlanta, were acute, the fair was largely attended, and not only by Negroes, but by many white visitors. This brunt of the work of organization fell upon R. R. Wright, president of the Georgia State Industrial College colored of savannah president wright is of full-blooded african descent his grandmother who reared him being an african negro of the mandingo tribe just at the close of the war he was a boy in a freedman school in atlanta one sunday general o o howard came to address the pupils when he had finished he expressed a desire to take a message back to the people of the North. "'What shall I tell them for you?' he asked. A little black boy in front stood up quickly and said, "'Tell em, Massa, we is risin'. Upon this incident, John Greenleaf Whittier wrote a famous poem, and at the Negro Fair, crowning the charts which had been prepared to show the progress of the Negroes of Georgia, I saw this motto. We are rising. The little black boy grew up, was graduated at Atlanta University, studied at Harvard, traveled in Europe, served in the Spanish-American War, and is now seeking to help his race to get an industrial training in the college which he organized in 1891. The attendance at the fair in Macon was between twenty five thousand and thirty thousand the negroes raised eleven thousand dollars and spent seven thousand dollars and planned for a greater fare the next year in this enterprise they had the sympathy and approval of the best white people a vivid glimpse of what the fare meant is given by the daily news of macon a white newspaper the fair shows what progress can be accomplished by the industrious and thrifty negro who casts aside the belief that he is a dependent and sails right in to make a living and a home for himself some of the agricultural exhibits of black farmers have never been surpassed in macon on the whole 
the exposition just simply astounded folks who did not know what the negro was doing for himself another significant feature about the fair was the excellent behavior of the great throngs of colored people who poured into the city during its progress there was not an arrest on the fairgrounds and very few in the city the better class of negro farmers indeed have shown not only a capacity for getting ahead individually but for organizing for self-advancement and even for working with corresponding associations of white farmers the great cotton and tobacco associations of the south which aim to direct the marketing of the product of the farms have found it not only wise but necessary to enlist the cooperation of negro farmers at the annual rally of the dark tobacco growers at guthrie kentucky last september many negro planters were in the line of parade with the whites the farmers conferences held at hampton tuskegee calhoun and at similar schools illustrate in other ways the possibilities of advancement which grow out of land ownership by the negroes the penalties of being free so much for the sunny side of the picture the broad gauge landlord and the prosperous tenantry conditions in the black belt are in one respect much as they were in slavery times or as they would be under any feudal system if the master or lord is good the negro prospers if he is harsh grasping unkind the negro suffers bitterly it gets back finally to the white man in assuming supreme rights in the south political social and industrial the white man also assumes heavy duties and responsibilities he cannot have the one without the other and he takes to himself the pain and suffering which goes with power and responsibility of course scarcity of labor and high wages have given the really ambitious and industrious negro his opportunity and many thousands of them are becoming more and more independent by the favor or the ill will of the whites and therein lies a profound danger not only to the negro but to the south gradually losing the support and advice of the best type of white man the independent negro finds himself in competition with the poorer type of white man whose jealousy he must meet he takes the penalties of being really free escaping the exactions of a feudal life he finds he must meet the sharper difficulties of a free industrial system and being without the political rights of his poor white competitor and wholly without social recognition discredited by the bestial crimes of the lower class of his own race he has indeed a hard struggle before him in many neighborhoods he is peculiarly at the mercy of this lower-class white electorate and the self-seeking politicians whose stock in trade consists in playing upon the passions of race hatred two i come now to the reverse of the picture when the negro tenant takes up land or hires out to the landlord he ordinarily signs a contract or if he cannot sign about half the negro tenants of the black belt are wholly illiterate he makes his mark he often has no way of knowing certainly what is in the contract though the arrangement is usually clearly understood and he must depend on the landlord to keep both the rent and the supply store accounts in other words he is wholly at the planter's mercy a temptation is dangerous for the landlord as the possibilities which it presents are for the tenant it is so easy to make large profits by charging immense interest percentages or outrageous prices for supplies to tenants who are too ignorant or too weak to protect themselves that the stories of the oppressive landlord in the south are scarcely surprising it is easy when the tenant brings in his cotton in the fall not only to underweigh it 
but to credit it at the lowest prices of the weak and this dealing of the strong with the weak is not southern it is human such a system has encouraged dishonesty and wastefulness it has made many landlords cruel and greedy it has increased the helplessness hopelessness and shiftlessness of the negro in many cases it has meant downright degeneration not only to the negro but to the white man these are strong words but no one can travel in the black belt without seeing enough to convince him of the terrible consequences growing out of these relationships the story of a negro tenant a case which came to my attention at montgomery alabama throws a vivid light on one method of dealing with the negro tenant some nine miles from montgomery lives a planter named t l mcculloch in december nineteen o three he made a contract with a negro named jim thomas to work for him according to this contract a copy of which i have the landlord agreed to furnish jim the negro with a ration of fourteen pounds of meat and one bushel of meal a month and to pay him besides ninety-six dollars for an entire year's labor on his part jim agreed to do good and faithful labor for the said t l mcculloch good and faithful labor means from sunrise to sunset every day but sunday and excepting saturday afternoon a payment of five dollars was made to bind the bargain just before christmas jim probably spent it the next day it is customary to furnish a cabin for the worker to live in no such place was furnished and jim had to walk three or four miles morning and evening to a house on another plantation he worked faithfully until may fifteenth then he ran away but when he heard that the landlord was after him threatening punishment he came back and agreed to work twenty days for the ten he had been away jim stayed some time but he was not only given no cabin and paid no money but his food ration was cut off so he ran away again claiming that he could not work unless he had a place to live the landlord went after him and had him arrested and although the negro had worked nearly half a year mcculloch prosecuted him for fraud because he had got five dollars in cash at the signing of the contract in such a case the alabama law gives the landlord every advantage it says that when a person receives money under a contract and stops work the presumption is that he intended to defraud the landowner and that therefore he is criminally punishable the practical effect of the law is to permit imprisonment for debt for it places a burden of proof on the negro that he can hardly overturn the law is defended on the ground that negroes will get money any way they can sign any sort of paper for it and then run off if there is not a stringent law to punish them but it may be imagined how this law could be used and is used in the hands of unscrupulous men to keep the negro in a sort of debt slavery when the case came up before judge william h thomas of montgomery the constitutionality of the law was brought into question and the negro was finally discharged often an unscrupulous landlord will deliberately give a negro a little money before christmas knowing that he will promptly waste it in a celebration thus getting him into debt so that he dare not leave the plantation for fear of arrest and criminal prosecution if he attempts to leave he is arrested and taken before a friendly justice of the peace and fined or threatened with imprisonment if he is not in debt it sometimes happens that the landlord will have him arrested on the charge of stealing a bridle or a few potatoes for it is easy to find something against almost any negro and he is brought into court in several cases i know of the escaping negro has even been chased down with bloodhounds on appearing in court the negro is naturally badly frightened 
the white man is there and offers as a special favor to take him back and let him work out the fine which sometimes requires six months often a whole year in this way negroes are kept in debt so-called debt slavery or peonage year after year they and their whole family one of the things that i couldn't at first understand in some of the courts i visited was the presence of so many white men to stand sponsor for negroes who had committed various offenses often this grows out of the feudal protective instinct which the landlord feels for the tenant or servant of whom he is fond but often it is merely the desire of the white man to get another negro worker in one case in particular i saw a negro brought into court charged with stealing cotton does anybody know this negro asked the judge two white men stepped up and both said they did the judge fined the negro twenty dollars and costs and there was a real contest between the two white men as to who should pay it and get the negro they argued for some minutes but finally the judge said to the prisoner who do you want to work for george the negro chose his employer and agreed to work four months to pay off his twenty dollar fine and costs sometimes a man who has a debt against a negro will sell the claim which is practically selling the negro to some farmer who wants more labor a case of this sort came up in the winter of 1907 in Rankin County, Mississippi, the facts of which are all in testimony. A Negro named Dan January was in debt to a white farmer named Levi Carter. Carter agreed to sell the Negro and his entire family to another white farmer named Patrick. January refused to be sold. According to the testimony, Carter and some of his companions seized January, bound him hand and foot, and beat him most brutally, taking turns in doing the whipping until they were exhausted and the victim unconscious. January's children removed him to his home, but the white men returned the next day, produced a rope, and threatened to hang him unless he consented to go to the purchaser of the debt the case came into court but the white men were never punished january was in jackson mississippi when i was there he still showed the awful effects of his beating end of part one of chapter five Part Two of Chapter Five of Following the Color Line An Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy by Ray Stannard Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Keeping Negroes Poor This system has many bad results. It encourages the Negro in crime. He knows that unless he does something pretty bad, he will not be prosecuted because the landlord doesn't want to lose the work of a single hand he knows that if he is prosecuted the white man will if possible pay him out it disorganizes justice and confuses the ignorant negro mind as to what is a crime and what is not a negro will often do things that he would not do if he thought he were really to be punished he comes to the belief that if the white man wants him arrested, he will be arrested, and if he protects him, he won't suffer, no matter what he does. Thousands of Negroes, ignorant, weak, indolent, today work under this system. There are even landlords and employers who will trade upon the Negro's worst instincts, his love for liquor, for example, in order to keep him at work. An instance of this sort came to my attention at Hawkinsville while I was there. The white people of the town were making a strong fight for prohibition. The women held meetings, and on the day of the election marched in the streets, singing and speaking. 
but the largest employer of negro labor in the county had registered several hundred of his negroes and declared intention of voting them against prohibition he said bluntly if my niggers can't get whiskey they won't stay with me you've got to keep a nigger poor or he won't work this employer actually voted sixty of his negroes against prohibition but the excitement was so great that he dared vote no more and prohibition carried a step further brings the negro to the chain gang if there is no white man to pay him out or if his crime is too serious to be paid out he goes to the chain gang and in several states he is then hired out to private contractors the private employer thus gets him sooner or later some of the largest farms in the south are operated by chain gang labor the demand for more convicts by white employers is exceedingly strong in the montgomery advertiser for april tenth nineteen o seven i find an account of the sentencing of fifty-four prisoners in the city court fifty-two of whom were negroes the advertiser says the demand for their labor is probably greater now than it ever has been before numerous labor agents of companies employing convict labor reached montgomery yesterday and were busily engaged in maneuvering to secure part or even all of the convicts for their respective companies the competition for labor of all kinds it seems is keener than ever before known the natural tendency of this demand and from the further fact that the convict system makes yearly a huge profit for the state is to convict as many negroes as possible and to punish the offenses charged as severely as possible from the atlanta constitution of october thirteenth nineteen o six i have this clipping six months for potato theft columbus georgia october twelfth special in the city court yesterday charlie carter a negro was sentenced to six months on the chain gang or to pay a fine of twenty five dollars for stealing a potato valued at five cents serious crimes are sometimes compromised in a newspaper dispatch october sixth nineteen o six from eaton georgia i find a report of the trial of six negroes charged with assault with the intent to kill all were found guilty but upon a recommendation of mercy they were sentenced as having committed misdemeanors rather than felonies they could therefore have their fines paid and five were immediately released by farmers who wanted their labor the report says that of thirty-one misdemeanors during the month it is expected that none will reach the chain gang since there are three farmers to every convict ready to pay the fine still other methods are pursued by certain landlords to keep their tenants on the land in one extreme case a negro tenant after years of work decided to leave the planter he had had a place offered him where he could make more money there was nothing against him he simply wanted to move but the landlord informed him that no wagon would be permitted to cross his the planters land to get his household belongings the negro being ignorant supposed he could thus be prevented from moving and although the friend who was trying to help him assured him that the landlord could not prevent his moving he dared not go in another instance also extreme a planter refused to let his tenants raise hogs because he wanted them to buy salt pork at his store it is indeed through the plantation store which corresponds to the company or truck store of northern mining regions that the unscrupulous planter reaps his most exorbitant profits negroes on some plantations whether they work hard or not come out at the end of the year with nothing part of this is due of course to their own improvidence but part in too many cases is due to exploitation by the landlord 
one biscuit to eat and no place to sleep. Booker T. Washington, in a letter to the Montgomery Advertiser on the Negro labor problem, tells this story. I recall that some years ago a certain white farmer asked me to secure for him a young colored man to work about the house and to work in the field. The young man was secured, a bargain was entered into, to the effect that he was to be paid a certain sum monthly, and his board and lodging furnished as well. At the end of the colored boy's first day on the farm he returned. I asked the reason, and he said that after working all the afternoon he was handed a buttered biscuit for his supper and no place was provided for him to sleep. At night he was told he could find a place to sleep in the fodder loft. This white farmer, whom I know well, is not a cruel man and seeks generally to do the right thing. But in this case he simply overlooked the fact that it would have paid him in dollars and cents to give some thought and attention to the comfort of his helper. This case is more or less typical. Had this boy been well cared for, he would have advertised the place that others would have sought work there. Such methods mean, of course, the lowest possible efficiency of labor, ignorant, hopeless, shiftless. The harsh planter naturally opposes Negro education in the bitterest terms and prevents it wherever possible, for education means the doom of the system by which he thrives. Negro with Nineteen Children Life for the tenants is often not a pleasant thing to contemplate. I spent much time driving about on the great plantations and went into many of the cabins. Usually they were very poor, of logs or shacks, sometimes only one room, sometimes a room and a sort of lean-to. At one side there was a fireplace, often two beds opposite, with a few broken chairs or boxes and a table. Sometimes the cabin was set up on posts and had a floor, sometimes it was on the ground and had no floor at all. The people are usually densely ignorant and superstitious. The preachers they follow are often the worst sort of characters, dishonest and immoral. The schools, if there are any, are practically worthless. The whole family works from sunrise to sunset in the fields. Even children of six and seven years old will drop seed or carry water. Dr. W. E. B. Dubois, himself a Negro, who has made many valuable and scholarly studies of Negro life, gives this vivid glimpse into a home where the Negro and his wife had nineteen children. He says, This family of twenty-one is a poverty-stricken, reckless, dirty set. The children are stupid and repulsive and fight for their food at the table. They are poorly dressed, sickly, and cross. The table dishes stand from one meal to another unwashed, and the house is in perpetual disorder. Now and then the father and mother engage in a hand-to-hand -hand fight. Never heard the name of Roosevelt. It would be impossible to overemphasize the ignorance of many Negro farmers. It seems almost believable but after some good-humored talk with a group of old Negroes, I tried to find out how much they knew of the outside world. I finally asked them if they knew Theodore Roosevelt. They looked puzzled, and finally one old fellow scratched his head and said, "'Where you say this here man lives?' "'In Washington,' I said. "'You've heard of the President of the United States?' "'I reckon I don't know.' he said. And yet this old man gave me a first-class religious exhortation, and one in the group had heard of Booker T. Washington, whom he described as a powerful big nigger. Why Negroes Go to Cities I made inquiries among the Negroes as to why they wanted to leave the farm and go to cities. 
the answer i got from all sorts of sources was first the lack of schooling in the country and second the lack of protection and i heard also many stories of ill treatment of various sorts the distrust of the tenant of the landlord in keeping his accounts all of which dimly recognized tends to make many negroes escape the country if they can indeed it is growing harder and harder on the great plantations especially where the management is by overseers to keep a sufficient labor supply in some places the white landlords have begun to break up their plantations selling small farms to ambitious negroes a significant sign indeed of the passing of the feudal system an instance of this is found near thomaston georgia where dr c b thomas has long been selling land to negroes and encouraging them to buy by offering easy terms near dayton Messrs. price and allen have broken up their lockhart plantation and are selling it out to negroes i found similar instances in many places i visited commenting on this tendency the thomaston post says this is in part a solution of the so-called negro problem for those of the race who have property interests at stake cannot afford to antagonize their white neighbors or transgress the laws the ownership of land tends to make them better citizens in every way more thoughtful of the right of others and more ambitious for their own advancement at this place a number of neat and comfortable homes a commodious high school and a large lodge building besides a number of churches testify to the enterprise and thrift the best class of our colored population the tendency towards cutting up the large plantations is beginning to show itself and when all of them are so divided there will be no agricultural labor problem except perhaps in the gathering of an especially large crop three i have endeavored thus to give a picture of both sides of conditions in the black belt exactly as i saw them i can now do no better in further illumination of the conditions i have described than by looking at them through the eyes and experiences of two exceptionally able white men of the south both leaders in their respective walks of life neither of them politicians and both incidentally planters at jackson mississippi i met major r w millsaps a leading citizen of the state he comes of a family with the best southern traditions behind it he was born in mississippi graduated before the war at harvard college and although his father a slave owner had opposed secession the son fought four years in the confederate army rising to the rank of major he came out of the war as he says with no earthly possessions but a jacket and a pair of pants with a hole in them but he was young and energetic he began hauling cotton from jackson to natchez when cotton was worth almost its weight in gold he received ten dollars a bale for doing it and made four thousand dollars in three months he is now the president of one of the leading banks in mississippi interested in many important southern enterprises and the founder of millsaps college at jackson a modest useful christian gentleman an experiment in trusting negroes near greenville mississippi major millsaps owns a plantation of five hundred acres occupied by twenty tenants some seventy-five people in all it is in one of the richest agricultural sections the mississippi bottoms in the united states up to eighteen ninety he had a white overseer and he was constantly in trouble of one kind or another with his tenants when the price of cotton dropped he decided to dispense with the overseer entirely and try a rather daring experiment 
in short he planned to trust the negroes he got them together and said i am going to try you i am going to give you every possible opportunity if you don't make out i will go back to the overseer system in the sixteen years since then no white man has been on that plantation except as a visitor the land was rented direct to the negroes on terms that would give both landlord and tenant a reasonable profit did it work i asked i have never lost one cent said major millsaps no negro has ever failed to pay up and you couldn't drive them off the place when other farmers complain of shortage of labor and tenants, I never have had any trouble. Every negro on the place owns his own mules and wagons and is out of debt. Nearly every family has bought or is buying a home in the little town of Leland nearby, some of which are comfortably furnished. They are all prosperous and contented. How do you do it? I asked the secret he said is to treat the negro well and give him a chance i have found that a negro like a white man is most responsive to good treatment even a dog responds to kindness the trouble is that most planters want to make too much money out of the negro they charge him too much rent they make too large profits on the supplies they furnish I know merchants who expect a return of fifty per cent on supplies alone. The best Negroes I have known are those who are educated. Negroes need more education of the right kind, not less, and it will repay us well if we give it to them. It makes better, not worse, workers. I asked him about the servant problem. We never have any trouble, he said. I apply the same rule to servants as to the farmers. Treat them well. Don't talk insultingly of their people before them. Don't expect them to do too much work. I believe in treating a Negro with respect. That doesn't mean to make equals of them. You people in the North don't make social equals of your white servants. Jefferson Davis's Way with Negroes then he told a striking story of Jefferson Davis. I got a lesson in the treatment of Negroes when I was a young man returning south from Harvard. I stopped in Washington and called on Jefferson Davis, then United States Senator from Mississippi. We walked down Pennsylvania Avenue. Many Negroes bowed to Mr. Davis, and he returned the bow. He was a very polite man. I finally said to him that I thought he must have a good many friends among the Negroes. He replied, I can't allow any Negro to outdo me in courtesy. Plain Words from a White Man A few days later, on my way north, I met at Clarksdale, Mississippi, Walter Clark, one of the well-known citizens of the state and president of the Mississippi Cotton Association. In the interests of his organization, he has been speaking in different parts of the state on court days and at fairs. And the burden of his talks has been not only organization by the farmers, but a more intelligent and progressive treatment of Negro labor. Recognizing the instability of the ordinary Negro, the crime he commits, the great difficulties which the best-intentioned southern planters have to meet, Mr. Clark yet tells his southern audiences some vigorous truths. He said in a recent speech, Every dollar I own those Negroes made for me. Our ancestors chased them down and brought them here. They are just what we make them. By our own greed and extravagance, we have spoiled a good many of them. It has been popular here, now happily growing less so, to exploit the Negro by high store prices and by encouraging him to get into debt. 
it has often made him hopeless we have a low element of white people who are largely responsible for the negro's condition they sell him whiskey and cocaine they corrupt negro women a white man who shoots craps with negroes or who consorts with negro women is worse than the meanest negro that ever lived at coffeeville where mr clark talked somewhat to this effect an old man who sat in front suddenly jumped up and said that's the truth bully for you bully for you in his talk with me mr clark said other significant things our people have treated the negroes as helpless children all their days the negro has not been encouraged to develop even the capacities he has he must be made to use his own brains not ours put him on his responsibility and he will become more efficient a negro came to me not long ago complaining that the farmer for whom he worked would not give him an itemized account of his charges at the store i met the planter and asked him about it he said to me the black nigger what does he know about it he can't read it but he is entitled to it isn't he i asked him and the negro got it the credit system has been the ruin of many negroes it keeps them in hopeless debt and it encourages the planter to exploit them that's the truth my plan is to put the negro on a strict cash basis give him an idea of what money is by letting him use it three years ago i started it on my plantation a negro would come to me and say boss i want a pair of shoes all right i'd say i'll pay you spot cash every night and you can buy your own shoes in the same way i made up my mind that we must stop paying negroes fines when they got into trouble i know planters who expect regularly every monday to come into court and pay out about so many negroes it encourages the negroes to do things they would not think of doing if they knew that they would be regularly punished i've quit paying fines my negroes if they get into trouble have got to recognize their own responsibility for it and take what follows that's the only way to make men of them what we need in the south is intelligent labor more efficient labor i believe in the education of the negro industrial training is needed not only for the negro but for the whites as well the white people down here have simply got to take the negro and make a man of him in the long run it will make him more valuable to us end of chapter five end of part one the negro in the south